Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio. You know, the month of March is all about uh, Irish American history. So we thought, hey, why not revisit a topic we talked about many years ago with artist Victoria Chick. Uh, This is all about origins of Celtic art, and it rolls deep. It's very fascinating. Uh, Victoria is a contemporary figurative artist. She's an early 19th and 20th century print collector. She's based in Silver City, New Mexico, which is right by the Gila Cliff Dwellings. It's on the southwest uh, part of the land of enchantment, uh, New Mexico. And you can go to her website to see her art. Go to victoriachick.com. But she's on our show every third Saturday here on Big Blend Radio to talk about art history, art, and also to give us updates on the continuing development of the Southwest Regional Museum of Art and Art Center uh, that she is working on with a team of amazing people to make this happen in Silver City, which is a beautiful art community. But today, it's all about the origins of Celtic art. So welcome back, Victoria. How are you? Oh, thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. It's a great day in New Mexico. Oh, uh, Always is. It always is. <laughs> I'm, pumped up, I'm pumped up about Celtic art. So this is a good spot to be. You know, it's so funny. Um, today, I know we're recording this just a couple days before this airs, which airs the day after St. Patrick's Day. But uh, we had a, a friend from Scotland on the show uh, today for today's Big Daily Blend, our new show on Spotify. And so I started talking. She was talking about caper tossing and talking about uh, the dance, Highland dance. and. Uh, we got into this whole conversation because of what you what you're talking about. We were talking about you. Basically, you should have had your ears ringing and nose burning okay. yesterday <laughs> when we were recording this. Um, but it's it's kind of interesting when we were talking about the Celts and how different it is even between Ireland and Scotland. Yes. the Celtic roots, how the how the difference is. So this is where we sh- we've got to kind of start with who the Celts are right? Where where they kind of came from before we can even well, get to the art. That's a good place. Uh, the oldest, the, I think the, the oldest building in Ireland uh, is probably the New Grange tomb. And at that time, the time that that was built, which was like almost 3,000 years ago, the Celts, the, there were no Celts there that we would, we would identify as being Celts. Um, but there were were people there um, who knew a lot, uh, who, who had who had history. When we talk about when we talk about uh, the Celts, we're talking about actually a, a whole conglomeration of people that moved from as far to the east as the Scythians, which were partially in what is now Russia and partly in what is now Iraq. So uh, Iran, that whole that whole area. So. They were a tribe that was very um, warlike, and they were a tribe that was uh, always on the move. They didn't have cities for long because they were they were they were more nomadic. And the very interesting thing is, many of them had red hair. Mm. So, so um, we think of Irishmen as being redheaded, and there may, there probably were some Irishmen with with red hair genes, but um, they, when they met, they when this group of of Scythians moved across Europe, um, I think they they dragged their gene they dragged their genes with them, and they met the Irish, and so now a lot of Irish people have red hair. But if, if, before that, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, well, it's, it's when, I mean, no, when, there's just so there's all of that. Well, it's a cultural. You've got to, the the people <laughs> change, right? Because yeah. and you could always be the black sheep, you know, <laughs> the Irish black sheep, and have black hair, right? I don't yes. know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if they're black sheep, but yeah, there are a lot of dark haired Irishmen too. So, mm-hmm. so the the Scythians, if if you look at their artwork from from. 3,000 to 2,000 years ago, and you could, there's, there are still artifacts that you can see um, where, they, where they originated. Um, those those art, artifacts and those, those were practical um, things like clothing. They were they were saddles. There were there was metal work and so forth. They it was the designs they used were symmetrical. For the most part, and there was a lot of of linear work that was interlaced, um, coming back onto itself, and um, it was it was very 
intricate, very ornate. Um, it was basically abstract rather than, rather than having uh, figures, recognizable figures in it. So anyway, those people started moving east and they would, they would go so far and they would uh, come to, a, come to a, a, a area that was already uh, peopled. They would, they would mingle with those people. They, would, they might, might have war with them, mm -hmm. but they also intermarried. So some people just sort of folded over and they just said, yes, come on in. And they got Ooh. along for a while. But then, then the, the, the Scythian people, people would get restless again and they would they decide it was time to move on. So the people that intermarried with them came with them and they came to the next area. So one of the, one of the biggest archaeological sites is in Switzerland, of all places. Um, uh, there's a big archaeological site called La Tienne. Um, and the, that was excavated back in the late 19th century. And they unearthed a whole bunch of metal objects um, with the Celtic, the Celtic work, workmanship. And they could tell it was really old. Um, it was from about 400 to 300 BC. Wow. So the, the Celts were on the march <laughs> early, you know. Um, anyway, one one of the reasons they, they change that we find all these things by the time in, um, of the 19th century was that they were they had changed their burial practices or their their practice of death because they started burying things um, in the in the third century BC, whereas before that they just um, burned everything. They got they got rid of their bodies by burning them cremation. Hmm. So that you know when they're when everything's cremated, it doesn't leave much of a record. So right. um, the burials start started being great because now they had all these they had a record of what their art was like. And but when you know what their art is like, you kind of can extrapolate other things about the culture. So. <laughs> I, I think continue. it's interesting, just going back to their burial thing, yeah. I think that's so interesting how they changed it. I wonder what you made them right. change. And you what don't... was it, you know, with the well, burials? Because Native Americans did that too. They buried in different ways. I mean, in Silver City, you can go to, um, to the uh, museum at, at the university there and see from the, the Mogollon culture and how they kept the body inside the home, Yes, you know, for a certain while. They used that... Um, clay pot and then they would smash the clay pot for the spirits to go out and all kind and somebody can correct me on that but it, there's a lot of cultures around the world who are doing the same thing which i always find interesting but there's all these mounds that we have in this country and i know that it happens in ireland and scotland and but that there's mounds there's burial mounds that we started saying okay we need to bury it but a lot of native american mounds like in uh, the Toltec um, archaeological site that we went to in, in Arkansas, just outside Little Rock, they were saying there's a there's a chance that Ponce de Leon's uh, sword is in there. So they're still finding mm -hmm. out about that. From what I know, I don't know if they've confirmed it yet. But mm -hmm. a lot of what was buried was actually like their garbage. It, you know, you're, you're <laughs> trash. It wasn't necessarily people or you know what I mean it's like this different kind of mounds there's burials right. and then there's like here's my trash mound the burial grounds to the left you know it's, yes it's, well uh, you can you can kind of tell the difference you know when people were were depending on clay pottery for uh cooking and for uh storing storing grains and that sort of thing um they the, the, you'll find the smash, the smash pottery, and, and there seems to be two different kinds. Like you say, um, one kind does does seem like garbage because it's everything's just in shards. But there's another kind that people find that uh, archaeologists find, and um, hmm. that looks like burial practice, where where you have a, cont a container, and the bottom of the container has just a small part of it um, broken out, and hmm. that, from other other burial burial sites that have the, the body still there with a pot on top of the face they can they've extrapolated that this this hole in the bottom is kind of to release the spirit of the person mm. so it's, it's all very interesting very 
very interesting. So the burial part for the Celts, though, was that's where you started to see the art. Was it art that was decorative, you know, for art sake? Or was it more of like things that were functional? Because a lot of times art is functional yeah. or or like yeah. then we go to, you know, this, uh, petroglyphs and all of that. That's a little different, too. This is functional. Okay. Um, the stuff that they found at La Tienne, um, they put the, they seem to put objects into the graves that thought the deceased would need in the afterlife. So there were collars, there were shields, there were bowls, um, some other kinds of, of objects that would be inside um, ju jewelry, uh, not in the not in the sense maybe that we think of jewelry today, but um, body body jewelry, uh, music pounded metal and um, uh, hmm. decorated with patterns on it. So uh, this is also the time when they started, instead of having in total um, abstraction in their in their engraving and, and the way, their decoration of, of especially of metal, they started including um, shapes that you would recognize, like birds, for instance, mm. or um, snakes were another one that I think oh. they liked. They liked snakes because they really liked curvilinear <laughs> shapes, and um, so that so that. Um, the stake was kind of a natural um, thing like vines would be. So, and then they also started be, at this time, started including um, sort of an, an enamel on some of the parts of the um, body body um, jewelry. So um, they had to have a different kind of, they have a different kind of technology for that. They had to have a fire that was hot enough to melt glass and fuse it to metal. Hmm. So I think they learned they learned some things I believe from every every culture that they conquered, and then they of course had their had, had some things that they brought along too that they introduced into into these new cultures. You know I think it's interesting about the snakes. Um, you think about Saint Patrick and he was supposedly got rid of the snakes of Ireland. Yeah, I think that's more of a metaphor, right? Um, <laughs> versus, you know, but so I mean that's a little different. But uh, you've got to think serpents back then was a big deal. I wonder at that point when we look at the serpent was um, medicinal as well. So those the symbol of medicine and health, how they yeah. did that. But then the circles, like when we look at New Mexico and the Southwest, like just down the road from me in Saguaro National Park, at Signal Hill, there's this, you know, this famous petroglyph. And it's a complete circle, like just, it, it's like a maze, like someone did a, or like a labyrinth on, on rock, you know, that yeah. kind of circular right. kind of thing. And I go like, where, what was that about? You know, and then you think about ceremonial structures that tend to be round. Um, I find that fascinating about the roundness. And it's it's almost like, you know, how people say, I can barely draw a straight line. How do you expect me to draw a circle, the perfect circle? If you can draw a perfect circle, you're nuts. Um, so I wonder back then what led them to the circular, because even in Celtic jewelry to this day, everything is circular. Yeah. You know, C circles seem to be sort of universal circles and spirals. And um, I can't, I can't um, give you a reason for it. Because, mm. I I mean I really don't know. Um, yeah, you weren't there, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I invented it, you know. Um, but but you're right about about different cultures, and it's worldwide, and um, it's all these things happened uh, seem to come into into play very early um, in 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 history and in, in ancient history. Uh, well, actually prehistory. So. Um, I uh, and they continue to use this. I mean, it, the Celts, the Celts continued with this kind of uh, circular pa uh, design preference. I'll say um, for a long time, for as long. And I, um, I think when we when they when they well, by the time the Celts finally made it into Ireland, and they they were kind of spread out by that time. So they. Mm -hmm. You say some some were in, in Scotland, some some were in Ireland. There was there were Celts in in part, parts of England. Um, I think the most uh, uh, we talked about the Newgrange tomb. 
where those people were using circular forms too and spirals. And of course, all these ancient cultures were really tuned into the, what was going on in the sky. And many of them, by the time they started building buildings, this, this meeting between the sky or the, especially the sun, the moon, um, they tried, they tried to not capture it, but they tried to um, almost have make, make buildings as, as places um, that were like observatories in a way, because when they, the sun was, was uh, direct, was, was um, being directed by their building to mm -hmm. hit a certain spot at a certain time of the year, the, the equinox or the solstice. Mm -hmm. So um, they used that for, for timekeeping. They used it for uh, to tell them when to harvest, when to plant. Um, that, that, that goes I, into I, I its cultures find, I find, again. I find that, it so amazing that that those, that those people were so observant. I mean, because... My, and especially like we think of the lunar cycle. I mean, mm -hmm. you would have to, you would have to follow, follow follow the moon through its through its path in the sky for nine years before it repeats. Right, that's so, crazy too, right? It I is mean, crazy. So I mean that I think that I think we don't give early people enough credit for intelligence, <laughs> really. Um, their visual observation and their memory must be must have been incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, it's not like you can just type it on your computer or Google right. it or, yeah. you know, and I think that's so interesting because, I mean, I know we've had this conversation before about Chaco Canyon, out, yes. you know, up in northern New Mexico, how these ceremonial structures I means everyone thinks they're aliens. This is, has to do <laughs> with alien stuff, right? But these round ceremonial structures that had to do with the equinox solstice were built just for this. And it has to do with sun. And so when they also do these doorways, and yeah. you, it's just in, in the buildings are so fascinating. How did they know how to do this? They didn't have the Home Depot book, you know, no. No, how did they, they know how to do it? Yeah. I mean, and, and then some of that craftsmanship, and these are buildings that have lasted centuries. That's what's mind blowing to me. You know, it's, it's still like everyone looks at the, you know, how the Sphinx, uh, the Sphinx, uh, the um, pyramids get built and things like that. How did they know how to do this where they would last? I know that they're going under some um, reconstruction right now with the pyramids and some restoration work. Mm -hmm. But it just still blows your, your mind. Like when you go to these places and you look at how they held everything together, how they made it work, ge you know, geometry wise. Yes. I mean, they were really, really, really smart. But I think they really went with the natural lands. And I think when you really are living in the wild, because you were at that time, this was kind of like the dawning of civilization in a way. As soon as you start planting crops, having livestock, now we're starting to enter into civilization. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of an interesting thing to see that they're still out there in the wilds. Look at the Gila cliff dwellings up the road from you too. Yes. How they yeah. had to do things. But they're they're with the elements a hundred percent. So your learning is going to be fast because of that. I think survival you don't have time to you ponder, <laughs> but you don't you need to get on with it. You know to survive. So well, I think that's part of it. Yeah, and but, spirituality too. Life yeah. is spirituality. Yeah. Um, by the time they by the time the Celts moved into Ireland. And met and met the people who who uh, sent you know probably at least a century before maybe maybe well more than that more probably more like um, a thousand years probably more like a thousand years before had built the New Grange tomb. Uh, we they found that that the their decorative ideals were similar, and so. Uh, you don't see a big a big contrast. You don't see a big flowering of anything. You just see more of it, more of the circular kind of thing, more of the interlaced kind of thing. And that lasted, oh gosh, um, until the Romans came. And um, hmm. it's interesting, you know, Rome, 
this was everything as far as the Catholic Church is concerned from a from a Roman standpoint really started about the say the the, the fourth century BC or, excuse me AD right. of course and yeah, yeah. and um so they started sending out you know the, the, the Apostle Paul probably got almost to Ireland in his in his earlier uh, travels and missions. But but when when the in the fourth century when the Romans started sending up more missionaries, Saint Patrick as we got sent to Ireland, and he had a lot of success. He's probably one not the first missionary there, but he was he started to have a lot of success at that time in converting people from paganism to Christianity. Mm. And so, but then, then, then the Rome, you know, Rome had, had conquered as far, as far to their west <laughs> as, as, as England and Ireland and Scotland. Well, then the Roman Empire started to decay and they, you know, all the Romans that had been um, on duty, all the, all the military people that had been on duty went back toward, toward Rome. Um, so Rome and then and Ireland got kind of got excuse me Ireland got kind of forgotten by Rome and until about the eighth century so it was like four hundred years there say where, where um, they were just doing their own thing and they were operating like early Christianity and um, they were using they were using uh, chapters, what, what they had written down, uh, what, of what we would call the Bible now, but they weren't, they maybe not, I'm not sure what they called it. They were probably calling it letters from Paul. Um, but um, all of a sudden, they were, they were moved, the, the Irish were moved to start um, missionary work. So they started sending people east <laughs> and you know they got they got pretty going far. back they're uh, going back yeah, yeah, yeah it's like... they're going back and they're 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 mission you know having these missions and all of a sudden rome goes what the heck is going on here yeah how dare where you these, where did these guys <clears throat> come from so so anyway there was there was kind of quite a um a conflict because what the early christians taught were, was not exactly what the roman church was teaching at that time, not the Roman Church had expanded a lot of stuff, and um, and so the two the two groups who who you know call themselves Christian were not really aligned one hundred percent. So they they had many meetings and over many years, and they finally uh, the, Irish, the Irish Catholics finally just said that they would be under the rule of the Pope in Rome. So that was I thought that was very interesting when I first studied that. Um, it's it it is because it, then you're still connecting it's with part Rome. of that. That's, it's part yeah. of that whole thing. Yeah, as part of that thing, um, what, uh, of the missionary work of the Irish, they were making manuscripts and and sending them out. Mm. That's one of the, one of three. So we have Celtic manuscripts, and we have many of them, and they're just beautifully beautifully decorated. But they still incorporate, even though they're they're totally Christian, they still incorporated the um, the ancient um, preference for curvilinear design and and for um, sym symmetrical um, shapes. So um, there, let's see. There's um, a lot of these illuminated manuscripts. Um, but yeah, the illumination. That's what I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah. For people to understand that, because you, again, going back to what were what were their um, supplies? Like an artist can go to a, you know you can go to a paint shop and get your paint, or you know what I mean. Order your charcoal <laughs> from yeah. Amazon, whatever it is, right? Whatever you're working with. But then, and back then, you were saying like, hey, they're they were you know using metals and stuff, whatever they had, and now we're going into actual books and illumination. So what were their tools to be able to do this, to be able to use, again, I think they were going towards light. This seems to be like a thing for them. But well, maybe, you know, if you're in Ireland and it's cold and, and cloudy, 
you want light. You well, know the, what I mean? the way, yeah, the, the way they did light was used by using gold mm -hmm. and, um, and, and painting with, with, with gold uh, leaf. But uh, what they painted on was basically lambskin and what we would call vellum, but it was mm -hmm. very fine grain lambskin. And um, they would copy, they, they worked in what was called script, scriptoriums, uh, which was a, a room mm -hmm. where they would meet and they would, it, and of course they were, they had to be, they most of them couldn't read. So they were, re, they, were oh. they were copying shapes and mm -hmm. which is writing to, <laughs> to us, but it was shapes. Right. To, and so they, 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 most of them couldn't read. Um, if they made it, if they made any error, they would throw the whole thing out. So oh. they were, were very careful, <laughs> obviously, uh, because uh, vellum wasn't that easy easy to come by. Wow, um, I had no idea that they would just <laughs> toss it. You know, get yeah. this. Yeah, so you can't. Yeah, you. So we, and they it's would, like before we had the delete button. <laughs> I know they didn't have that. Um, wow. So and then the and then the, if it was a book, these pages would be sewn together. Um, but many times they were they were um, separate. Sometimes they were they would put them into books, and of course the books were very precious. Um, the process, of course, was really painstaking. Um, if yeah, they, finally they, if they could get a get a whole book together with no mistakes, um, then then it would be. Um, Preserved. I mean, they were so careful about these things. They just they they kept them um, to to be used in services. I mean, because hardly I mean, hardly anybody read. You know, nobody could uh, in the general public public could read. So they were dependent on how uh, wow. whichever whichever level of clergy could read to them. You know, it was it was a it was a big deal. It was like every time it was almost mysterious because this, you know, they would go to a meeting that was a spiritual uh, gathering and they would read from this ma magical page that was decorated <laughs> and and God's word. So they were in awe really of these of these um, accounts on these in these uh, pages that were wow. um, illuminated manuscripts. Well, that's interesting because when you think going to a church, you get hymnals and Bibles, right? You're right there, and it's just oh, here's and there's still you know art in them, you know, depending on who, what, and where. But yeah, but you but know, I find this fascinating. Yeah, Bibles are so commonplace. You know, people people have a family Bible. Well, they probably in a lot of cases. They, they never look at it unless they're recording a birth or a death. Which is important. Yeah, that's why Bibles, yeah. I mean, just you got to keep your but, grandparents' you know, we, we Bibles. Did, yeah. In England, nobody was allowed to have a Bible until, until well, I mean, Tyndale started producing Bibles in the 11th century, but, but he was killed because he wasn't mm -hmm. allowed to do that. So, I mean, even for us today, we take what we take for granted today um, is something that's actually you know relatively newly allowed mm. so it's it's, well, um, it's it's just interesting it's because interesting. yeah you've got these books and then i know there's the book of kells uh you know that uh we, we can right. talk about too but then but this illumination wasn't just in books that they did right didn't they do it also on other things i mean uh, just going and everyone victoria's article about this is up on blend radio and tv.com and uh this is i mean it's just this is just it's like the history i always say the arts right really tell the truth of what's going on in the world and yeah. it's just interesting because they kind of use this on other items you know to create art and that illumination yeah it wasn't the, just books. the illumination the, the um Illumination really more meant more like um, being able to see something more than more than light in this case, I think, um, because as I said, people couldn't read, so they ha having a picture to describe the story that's being told um, was illuminating. You know, it wasn't it, it wasn't 
physical light, but it was, it was like a light to them, you know, to, to understand. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh gosh, I, um, the book of Duro is another one. Um, there was the Lindisfarne gospels. Those were interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But that's all, this all came about because of the monastic system where you had all these people that devoted their lives to copying these manuscripts. Even if they couldn't read. Right, right. But they were, but they were just going by shapes. Yeah. I mean, they had to get to some way of understanding the alphabet, but did not, that's, that's mind blowing, you know? It is, it is. Yeah. Wow. We're, yeah. So, um the other thing about Celtic art that was really outstanding um, from early on, from about, oh gosh, uh, probably uh, 750, maybe to up until the, the Gothic period, were the, the crosses that were um, established mm. in, in Ireland and some in England. And, and as you said, some, some in your other guests said there were some in Scotland. So um, they got around. <laughs> Uh, these were very tall. They were, you know, the early before Christianity came, the there was these stones that were erected for for some reason. We not we're not sure what the reason was. They were called Ogham stones, mm -hmm. but, and um, they were plain, but they were like they were, you know, might be four to six feet tall. Wow. And they 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 marked something, but um when the when the Christianity came in, they started putting stones up uh, for, you know, it might be for a grave marker, it might be, might be for some other reason, but they would, they would be Celtic in character and that they were, they had a, um, they had a, a, a tall metal section and then they had an arms out to the side. So it was cross-like. And in the center where those two uh, arms met, there would be a circular area that ha would have a decoration on it. And it would be, um, and usually an interlaced decoration, uh, a linear kind of decoration. Um, with just, it's a sculpture because it's just raised up from the stone just slightly. And um, you see those all over. And those are typical, what we would call Celtic crosses. And they, the, the design, the interlaced design in the middle kind of was like a knot with the, um, but they they do call it the Celtic knot too. There is the, yes. I mean, even in quilting, there's the Celtic right. knot as a pattern for a quilt. Um, it's isn't a, there? It's a, it's a traditional design. Mm -hmm. And it's really and even lasts. for weddings, don't they have like a Celtic knot that is used for not in weddings, but in the you know the jewelry, like your your wedding ring. Um, yes, yes, they do. Hmm. Right. This is. I think it's cool. <laughs> I want to go to Ireland now and I want to go to Scotland. I, we haven't done Ireland yet, but Scotland yeah. and Wales we did. But it just is, it's always fascinating to me how close those countries are, but how different they are. I mean, yes. it's like you're right next to Arizona, but as soon as you cross that state line, I swear to God, it's different. It well, is. It is. You, there are some similarities in some terrain, but boom, geology. it's different. Yeah. Ge geology makes a, makes a, a big difference, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. with, with where people are. I mean, when I lived in California, um, Indians, the Indian tribes and the many, many, many Indian tribes were fascinating to me because some of them were only uh, 25 miles apart from each other, mm -hmm. but there was a mountain between them. And, uh, and so they, they, the tribes were, seemed to be restricted by their own geography. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I guess I've got so many, yeah. so many, yeah. So, and I think you know, you, you see that in any in any country that has um, a distinct, you know, uh, a distinct range or um, some other water area or something, you know, that it it uh, it keeps people from initially it keeps people from seeing each other. So they, yeah. they, get to be, they get to be close, their own group gets to be close knit and becomes tribal. Cool. It's interesting to me because, you know, when you go into what well, people always settle by water, because yeah. that's obviously a, a, a you know, vital source. And 
And that's the, that's what can you know make or break you too, you know. But you do need the water, but you're right. And and then there's the the tribes that disappear, like the Salado tribes up in um, Tonto National Monument area, up near yeah. Globe, Arizona. So it's kind of yes. it connects over to New Mexico because the Apaches were up there too and still there. Um, right. But the people they just like they disappeared, and we don't know if it was a drought or if the hunting went away. What what made him like kind of disappear and then we thought okay maybe they went down through the Hilo River down more towards <laughs> you know the Hohokams yeah. <clears throat> down by <clears throat> excuse me uh Gila River <clears throat> by Gila Arizona so there's a yeah. shift and we go where okay so were the Salado people the same as the Hohokams or did they intermingle like you were talking about with the Celts you know so there's all of that history yeah. that's fascinating and especially when you start to see art being the same but you can go around the world and see this art being the same but you know human beings were nomadic for for centuries yeah, yeah. and so there's going to be connectivity with that you know um i've done i've done some like studies in longitude latitude lines and looking at where cultures were and studying and do, i mean this was years ago mm-hmm. but studying like religious beliefs design just kind of even looks right of people and you could sit and go okay you stay on that latitude line and you'll see similarities along that latitude line go down in latitude maybe not so much it's really interesting to me yeah there's a connectivity and um you know it, but that again we were all nomadic sharing things and somebody will see this design just like an artist or a musician will hear a song and go Oh, I love that riff, man. I'm going to do something with that to create my own thing. You know, it's not, I'm not talking about <laughs> copyright stealing, but it's inspiration, right? right? So that's, right. that happens in art. It's like somebody figured out how to use oil paints. Hey, I want to know how to do that, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's the cool thing about this in this conversation. And again, just how yet similar, but so different, right? Because like what they do in Wales is different than what they do in Ireland. And then, you know, the art now, when I think about, you know, we've just been doing so much about Ireland lately with St. Paddy's Day and everything and, and just the history yeah. of it. But when you look at like Belfast and all the um, all the murals being political, right? This is, you know, the, they're using art as communication, as a way of making a point, a statement. Yeah. And um, so when we talk about the, the, oranges, the Celtic origins of art, I'm going to now look at it. Now look what's happening. <laughs> and when you think about the origin of art, like it goes to music. The bagpipes come from Egypt and yet they use them, you know, and it's or Egypt yeah, in that I mean, region. It's amazing. Well, yeah, there's not very many of us that would immediately draw that connection. You know, so 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 that is fascinating. Yeah. Just, it's a, yeah, so we yeah. have to all remember we're all connected at the end of the day. <laughs> you know, and but that's and and that's and some of us don't want to be. <laughs> I'm right. Just like wait, I don't know, but um, no, but really, I find it fascinating this history that that travels, and there's just this nomadic style of what happened in the world and people and how I don't think they're going to always find a similarity somewhere. Nothing's that pure, you know. Right. Now. You know, but I find it amazing about how how the arts have changed yet. You'll hear Celtic music, the traditional style, and then you'll hear, like there's a band we know, uh, Tempest, and they mix all of it together and they make it progressive to now a little bit of heavy rock. And so like even going to some of the Highland games or special festivals are really sought out. And then some are like, no, you're too progressive. We want, yeah. you know, yeah, you know, the the harp kind of thing. Um, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So it's like you, yeah. it's it's an interesting, uh, just like Louisiana, Victoria. Um, we went to that folk art festival. I know I always talk about this. It's uh-huh. One of the most amazing events I've ever been to in my life, because it's you're seeing, an you're seeing art forms being preserved and progressed at the same time and and lost like like the generational so there was a lot of people there with um just very local 
arts, like there was a lady we met who was basket weaving and her tribe, there's only 600 of them left, Native American mm. tribe. Her dad actually made their, their alphabet and dictionary uh, for the Library of Congress and it's all recognized and everything. Mm. And her basket sold out within hour, like boom, done. And so she was sitting there, we just sat and talked. And while we were there, there's a lady making uh, Sankey eggs. Uh, she's you know, Czech and Ukraine do this over Easter time, Eastern uh, Easter time. Mm -hmm. um, these beautiful eggs. And I mean, just these carvings and how they do this is incredible. It's all signs of fertility, but she's bringing that tradition and not letting it go away. And she teaches people right. to do it. So it doesn't go away. And it, in, I don't think she was like 100%, uh, it was, she Ukraine, or Czech, but she wasn't 100% that way. And I think her husband was more Louisianan and he's like, oh, I'll learn how to do it, you know? And, <laughs> and that was a fascinating process using wax and color and, and all of that. And then you go around the corner and here's Victorian dancing. Uh, uh, Victorian dancing, people in Victorian clothes doing the la di -da dancing. <laughs> and then around the corner, you're seeing you know, Cajun Zydeco music from families that have been doing it and, um, you know, people that are going to pass on at this time. And then you see the kids take it on, but then add to, they know how to do it traditionally, but they're adding to it. They're adding their own stuff to it now to make it more contemporary. So it's a very interesting thing how art evolves and changes, but I feel very strongly that um, it must evolve and change. But at the same time, something ha we have to somehow preserve the roots. So we progression doesn't mean anything without the roots. So I find yeah. that I find that leads to you in the museum what you're doing too. It's it goes to, you know, the arts have to be preserved in some way so you can have this lineage of understanding, right? You know, so yeah. You know the uh, we talked about. The what was going on in the eighth century, when, if you jump another, uh, let's see, another four, four centuries to five centuries, you're in the Gothic period. And, mm. and, and then a lot of the Gothic stuff uh, was brought into the, the new world. People were trying to look, um, I think they were trying to look impo important, but you have the, the Celtic um, beasts, as for, for example, uh, the, the, the manuscript, uh, snakes and the manuscript birds and, and the sometimes monsters, um, dragons and so forth. You see that that then by the, the Gothic area, that is translated into gargoyles on buildings. So it's translated into sculpture, and those that kind of of decoration was is was used a lot in the in the United States in say the. Uh, 19th century and even a little bit into the 20th century mm -hmm. and and then if you if you go farther I can think of another example of the kind of style that's this interlaced and interwoven and sort of one thing leads to you know very very easily leads to another thing remember do you remember uh, the Monty Python mm -hmm. drawings and stuff that were on mm -hmm. before the Monty Python show that that's a, that is a descendant of this Gothic curvilinear style. So you know these things, these, the, everything changes a little, but it's a, it's always influenced by th something that's come before it. Mm -hmm. Like it, when you even think of gargoyles and those kind of faces. Yes. Like if you look at uh, right. Celtic, the clan, the arts of the clans, the yes. crests, and how those are, and some of them are like. Dude, who thought of that? That looks like evil, man. You know, it's like, <laughs> don't mess with, you know, big old tongues hanging out and, you know, like yeah. eyes that are on fire and stuff, you know. And so it's interesting to me about that. And then then you go to the Celts and you go, okay, so when they um, Queen Elizabeth passed, you know, they had all these emergency plans for if something happened wherever she was. You know, they called it Operation yeah. Unicorn in Scotland, where she was. <laughs> Really? And I'm still trying to figure out the unicorn part. Like, where did the unicorn? Because there's unicorn things that happen in Celtic mysticism, and there's a lot of mysticism with the Celts, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm still trying to figure out the unicorn. Like, where did where did that come from? With the Celts, the unicorn. 
I know you didn't expect to come on and talk about unicorns today, but <laughs> no, there's just, something to, to it. Yeah, there is something to the unicorn. And I think it's like the forests and the unicorns. It's almost Robin Hoodish, you know, with the unicorns. It's this, I think they always had this others, there's God, and then there's this super, I think it's that blend of pagan, paganism and Christianity, where one's kind of touched each other, even though they fight against it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, um, I think there's something there with that mystical world and mystical beings they've got right. you know they believe in fairies and all of that you know in ireland especially the fairies but yeah. i find that fascinating and you know so the art documents that and yes. unicorns are everywhere but i just want to know who came up with a unicorn <laughs> i want to know <laughs> i want to know. know i can't i can't tell you definitely well mm -hmm. okay let's do that on the next show <laughs> victoria no, we've no. still got, still got okay short. It'll be a short yeah. show. <laughs> I know. Well, the next show, everybody, is going to be about the art in, in during the Civil War period. I mean, this is um, amazing. So stay tuned for that. So Victoria will be back on again in April, the third Saturday. Um, but the, in the meantime, check out our article on blendradioandtv.com. Just type in uh, Celtic Origins of Art or Victoria Chicken. You'll see all kinds of articles and hear all our interviews there, too. And of course, keep up with her at victoriachick.com and keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Thank you so much, Victoria. We're looking Yay. forward to, to the next one. Thank you, Lisa. I hope you have a good, a good weekend. I know. Well, being snowed in in Wisconsin, I'll tell you what, I need the unicorn to come pick us up and bring <laughs> us wine. All right. Your, your unicorn, you better hope the horn is like a scoop shovel, you know, and get I, you out of there. I know. That's what I thought. It could dig us out, dig us out, dig us out. All right. <laughs>